Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday. It's great to be with all of you as we continue on our book study that we've been doing all month long on Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich and Law of Success. And today we have a very special guest. Uh, ben Gay is with us. He is the last known living protege of Napoleon Hill. And uh, Ben, I'm going to share with you a little bit about his background. He is an absolutely extraordinary human being and a legend in the sales training industry. As most of you know, we've asked a man to be with us today whose name is Ben Gay III and whose sales training materials, the Closer Series and Sales Closing Power Books are synonymous with professional selling. Let me share with you about Ben Gay III. He's worked continuously as a commissioned salesman since he was 14 years old. When he was just 14, Ben was the number one salesman at Macy's Atlanta, as well as the youngest buyer in Macy's then a then 100 year history. He was the number one salesperson in a, in a large organization of manufacturer representatives in a major food brokerage company and the largest network marketing company in the world at the time in a 50 year old management consulting firm and yet another international direct sales company. In fact, Ben Gay has been the number one salesperson in every organization he has ever been in. He's written 12 books on the subject of sales and living successfully while ghostwriting another dozen or so for other sales trainers, speakers, and seminar leaders. In fact, it's been said, if you're really a student of professional selling, you have at least one of Ben Gay's books in your personal library, whether you know it or not. Ben, I want to welcome you to a special interview where we're going to be talking about your relationship with uh, Napoleon Hill. So welcome. Uh, thanks for being here today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the uh, number uh, first of all, I was the number one Krispy Kreme donut salesperson at fourteen. Macy's came later. <laughs> oh, gotcha! <laughs> they wouldn't let me in the store at fourteen. The uh, uh, so any, Kr Krispy Kreme was what hooked me in selling. I uh, won a bright red Columbia bicycle of being the number one Krispy Kreme donut salesman in Atlanta for some fundraising. I think it was putting the gold dome on the Georgia Capitol, bringing gold down from Atlanta, Georgia. So every time they show somebody on television with a Georgia, the Atlanta skyline background, I point out to Gigi that gold dome would not be there if I hadn't sold a whole bunch of Krispy Kreme donuts while eating about 10% of, <laughs> of my inventory. <laughs> So I appreciate being with you, and it's a pleasure to talk about Dr. Hill. Uh, you know, he told me many times he was afraid that he and his work would soon be forgotten. I was 25. He was 84 when we met, yeah. and he, he's been dead 51 years now. And so thanks yeah. to thanks you, to Eric. Thanks to you and Bob Proctor and me and lots of other people. I'm happy to tell Dr. Hill, if only spiritually, you haven't been forgotten. So tell us about how did you come to meet him in the first place? Well, he wrote a book. I, I worked for a company called Holiday Magic Cosmetics. We were the largest MLM direct sales company in the world at the time, bigger than Amway and Shackley combined. Uh, all the other companies you've heard I've worn around yet, they're spinoffs of what we started. And uh, somewhere along the line, Napoleon Hill caught wind of William Penn Patrick. He ran for governor of California against Ronald Reagan. He was a dynamic guy, great speaker, and so on. And he's the one that founded Holiday Magic Cosmetics and the one who uh, picked me out of the crowd to, to run it uh, oh, two and a half, three years after he started it. So uh, Dr. Hill, I don't know how, found out about Bill uh, and probably went to a few seminars or something. And in one of his books, he named Bill Patrick as one of the five greatest living uh, business leaders, I guess. It's been a long time since I've seen the exact text. And he came out to our office. I didn't know it. Uh, I, I knew because of some financial dealings that Bill was going to be in a book about something by somebody. But uh, 
I didn't even know he was in the building. And he came out to give Bill Patrick an award, uh, symbolism of his uh, mention in the book and a signed copy of the book, et cetera. And somewhere during that conversation back in Bill's office, uh, Bill decided that I, who was now president of the company at age 25, and we were soon wow. in today's money, uh, about a $3 billion company, and I couldn't read a balance sheet. I, I got there by hard work, personality, and speaking ability. Uh, other than that, running a big company, it was a bit of a stretch. I don't think an unbiased board of directors would have picked me, frankly. But Bill did because I won a national sales contest. Uh, the number one prize was a was a mystery prize. Two was a Rolls Royce. Three was a Lincoln Continental, I believe. Fourth was a Thunderbird, and then came the steak knives and death sets. And uh, uh, I, so I won the mystery prize. Zig, uh, who was working for us at the time. Uh, won the Rolls Royce, Jim Hearn won the Lincoln, and my sponsor in the business, Bill Dempsey, won the Thunderbird. So I'm flown out to California to be awarded the mystery prize, and it was presidency of the company. Wow. And I said to Bill, "What? why was that a mystery? He said, well, if somebody won it that I didn't like, I would have changed the prize. It was sort of <laughs> clever. But I had... That's I, yeah, I'd travel with Bill. I'd spent some time up close and personal with him flying around as his, the guy who introduced him at 25. We did 25 seminars in 25 different cities in 25 days, as best I recall. My introduction to the corporate jet world that made things like that possible. And so he'd gotten to know me, but I won the contest. And uh, so that's that happened. So that's how come in the, I'm in the building and perhaps in over my head and somewhere between the back of the building it was a long uh, building, went back to San Francisco Bay and up front, I was in the front, Bill was in the back. On the walk down that long hallway, he apparently said to Dr. Hill, I've got a young man running this business uh, who's doing a great job, sales are up and, and so on, but I think he may be in over his head and from time to time may need some guidance and he doesn't want to come to me for the guidance because then I'll know he isn't qualified <laughs> to have the <laughs> job to start with. So uh, that sort of a reconstruction of the conversation based on conversations with Bill and Dr. Hill later. So I'd like and you to be, much, go ahead. How much time um, were you able to be with Napoleon Hill before um, he was, he stopped working with you? about two and a half years. Uh, he wasn't there full time and we didn't have Zoom. So I was free to call him. <laughs> I was free to call him anytime I wanted, fly him out anytime I wanted and go back and meet with him, which I always did if I was anywhere in the Southeast, go to Columbia, South Carolina and hook up. So uh, he said, I want you to be his mentor and coach and so on. And they agreed. And from the front, from the back of the office to the front of the office, they agreed to a mentorship, uh, a $50,000 payment uh, a year to be my mentor. That's about 400000 or more in today's money. Wow. Uh, so just like Rodney Dangerfield used to say, the old comedian, that his family had to tie a pork chop around his neck so the dog would play with him. Uh, the pork chop around my neck was a $50,000 check. So he arrives at my, knocks on the door, opens it up, and there's Bill Patrick with this little old man. He didn't look, nowadays you'll see some of the older pictures, but back then he was a young man looking like he had a, a stick strapped to his back with his high collar. You probably have all seen those pictures. So when the door opened, I didn't recognize him. I just thought it was an old friend of Bill's. So I got up, walked around the desk and said, hi, I'm Ben Gay. And Bill looked at me like I was a specimen. He said, Ben, this is Dr. Napoleon Hill. And I said, oh, Dr. Hill, I'm very sorry. I didn't recognize you. He said, call me Nappy. And that began our first argument, uh, which went on for two and a half years. Every time I said Dr. Hill, he'd say Nappy. And I said, out of my Southern mouth, talking to a senior, he was old enough biologically to be my great grandfather. Um, out of my southern mouth talking to an elder with doctor in front of his name nappy is never going to come out of my mouth or that's never going to come out of my mouth 
I didn't even say it in arguments. So on that happy note, we began our relationship with a, a lunch. And uh, then uh, I said, why don't you stay at the house? And so uh, we had a big house in Marin County. One of the bedrooms became Dr. Hill's bedroom. No one else ever stayed there. Uh, and uh, at the end of my, I had a conference table as a desk to my left at the end of the, uh, the conference table was a chair. It was Dr. Hill's chair, whether he was in town or out of town, didn't make any difference. He had free run of the building. He could walk in and out of any meeting on any subject uh, without uh, an invitation or permission. And what he did normally, he taught me the love of legal pads. I'm, I'm never far from a legal pad. Uh, he would sit at the end of the desk when he was with me writing. And I, I never asked him what he was writing, probably another book or something or taking notes from the meeting he was in. And he would listen intently, spoke, uh, speak only if spoken to directly. Uh, and then at the end of the meeting, when everybody got up and walked out, uh, the office would sit 15 or so people. When everybody got up and walked out and the door clicked, out of my peripheral vision, I would look to see if his head came up. Because if it did, he had a comment to make about that meeting. If it didn't come up, uh, lunch was next. <laughs> so, uh, and Bill had made the pledge that nothing I said to him would ever get back to Bill. He didn't say it, but it was sort of like having a Catholic priest in confessional. And I tested the system a few times. Uh, to see if it would. I knew a couple of hot issues that Dr. Hill probably would want to tell him about. And I knew that Bill would explode if they happened, had to do with a coup. It had been tried earlier in the company before I got there by three of his early guys. So I told Dr. Hill that a bunch of us were considering a coup and for lack of a better word, and that we were going to give Bill 25%. Of the, I used all the figures from the real coup. But first, I was smart enough to write a letter to Bill and seal it in the art department with a wax seal and put it in his secretary's desk, telling Bill, you know, now that you've exploded, <laughs> here's what happened. I was testing to see if Dr. Hill would, would uh, keep a confidence. And uh, I put it in Marion McGinnis's desk drawer. He was, uh, Marion was his secretary, Bill's secretary. And I said, if Bill ever explodes and you hear cuss words and my name in the same sentence, hand him this letter. And uh, she put it in her desk drawer. And a few years, I was there several more years. Then a few years after I left, the company went under. And to my knowledge, when Marion McGinnis's desk was carried from the building in the top drawer, still sat that letter. Uh, Dr. Hill would not break a confidence which was one of his great lessons. I was asked one day in a seminar, what did you learn from Dr. Hill? What, what were the three things you learned from Dr. Hill? I hate questions like that because I, I learned three things an hour from Dr. Hill for two and a half years. But what came to my mind was integrity in all things, focus, because I have a tendency, I still do have a tendency. For instance, there's a television to my left right now and they just said, I could see with my cat-like peripheral vision, breaking news. It's all I can do to continue staring at this camera and not look over there and see what the breaking news is. So focus was part of my problem. And uh, when, whenever I was distracted or looked up or reacted to something out in my secretary's office, uh, Dr. Hill would say, Benjamin, focus. Just to train me, to, you know, you're, you're working on something, stay with it. And the other one was take action. And I'll tell you a little story with that. As you know, I'm full of stories. So I'm sure there was a question buried in this when we started. But uh, we were coming out with a men's cosmetic line, which doesn't sound very exciting now. But in the late 60s, mid 60s, late 60s, men's cosmetics were almost unheard of. We had Old Spice and Aqua Velvet shaving lotion. And that was about it. So now we're coming out with moisturizing cream and, and so on. So we're ha we had weekly meetings because we had the production guy and the purchasing guy and the art department and the advertising people and so on all had to be in sync. And Dr. Hill had come and gone, I mean, you know, gone home to South Carolina and come back weeks would go by and we're still having these meetings. And uh, 
I decided on the name. I have a secret for naming companies and product lines. If you remember to ask me later, I'll tell you what it is, semi-clever. Uh, we decided on the name, the general feeling of it, and so on. And so we had a meeting, and Dr. Hill was sitting at the end of the table writing. And I said, all right, we'll, be, we'll meet back here next, whatever, Thursday, whatever it was. And uh, they all got up and left. The door goes click, and Dr. Hill said, what are you going to know next Thursday that you didn't know today and haven't known for numerous weeks? I said, well... Um, I, I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> and he said, take action then. You're dithering. Take action. And that's the fourth one. Integrity, focus. The third one, uh, integrity, focus, and action were three of the major things he taught me. In that case, I called them all back in. And I said, does anybody need anything that before you do your part of what we're going to do with this line? You know, production, no. Uh, uh, purchasing, no, ready to go blah, blah, around the table. I probably would have gotten the same answer two months before. Uh, and I said, all right, let's do it, go. And so that product line was launched because Dr. Hill taught me to quit dithering and take action. He said, you can always when you make a mistake. You can always double back. When I started the 800 call center industry, I thought of Dr. Hill. It was, there was no call center industry. Uh, everybody had uh, voice machines, codophones back in those days, or an old-fashioned operator uh, system, uh, you know, with, with the cables and all, uh, or their phone went, went unanswered after hours. Uh, and so why not get an 800 line and staff it? Because 800 lines cost $10,000 a month per line in advance back then. And nobody could afford them. And, uh, and at the end of the month, that was only 240 hours. At the end of the month, you got another bill for your overtime plus the new bill for 10000 for this month. And uh, I figured out a way to timeshare, basically. Uh, timeshare business was just starting, and I was learning a little bit about that. We were their big trainer. And uh, uh, so I timeshared 800 lines, became the national communication center, the beginning of the call center industry. That's the good news. Bad news is when I left the company 10 years later, and we built the largest call center answering service, order taking service in the world, 98% of our volume came from things that were not part of the original plan, meaning my original plan and the services I wanted to offer and to whom I wanted to offer them, 90, I was 98% off the mark. But thanks to Dr. Hill, we started. You know, we, we got rolling. And that we, we, everything after that was mid-course corrections. Long answer to a short question, Eric, but that's how I met Dr. Hill. Now, you've had a um, <clears throat> very fascinating career. Um, you've done a lot. You've known a lot of folks. And, and I want to I bring up um, a story that you shared in a seminar one time that you were kind enough to come and speak at one of my events. And it was a small event. Um, I think it was in Rockland. And uh, it was on public speaking, of, if I'm correct. And I'd asked you as a favor if you would come and speak. And uh, you agreed. <clears throat> and one thing that stuck out to me, it struck me as you said, you used a very powerful word when you asked me to come and speak and you said the word favor. And that's why I'm agreeing to come and speak. And um, there was a woman in the audience, her name was Arby Robinson. And you had shared a story about um, interacting with Charlie Manson. And she asked you what made Charlie Manson so persuasive. And you had a very profound answer, especially nowadays with the smartphone, when we have such a, an attention problem. And, and for all of you listening, what, where I'm gonna, what I'm going to have Ben share, it's a really valuable sales lesson that you guys can use today. So um, I didn't prep you on this one, Ben, but do you remember when that question about what made Charlie Manson so persuasive or what your answer is? to what made him so persuasive he influenced other people to kill on his behalf? 
Yeah, that's one of the things people say, you know, Charlie Manson was a killer. Well, maybe someday we'll find out he killed somebody somewhere. But uh, he didn't do any of the famous killings. He talked other people into doing them. <laughs> it was rather interesting, especially since he was working with upper middle class educated people. Uh, Tex Watson, who's now a minister and so on. Uh, they weren't dummies. They came from good people, trained properly, raised properly, et cetera. Yet he persuaded them to be a good idea to creepy crawl into a house and stab people to death. So uh, I can tell you a couple of, I just talked to Harvey, by the way, and did a session with her uh, a week or so ago. Wonderful oh, lady. Wow. I thank you for the introduction. Yeah, we, we've done several things together. And uh, she's a really neat lady and bears a striking resemblance to my lovely wife, Gigi, coloring and hair length and, and everything. When I'm looking at her, I always, I'm a little intimidated of RV uh, because I think it's Gigi and she may start yelling at me at any moment. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I was teaching my people builders class at San Quentin State Prison, one of the more interesting endeavors uh, I ever got myself into. And uh, it was every Friday night from six o'clock Friday night to six o'clock Saturday morning, sort of a version of the encounter groups I taught in the mid 60s, leadership dynamics, mind dynamics, et cetera, the forerunner to Est and all those companies that they all started and those people work for us in, in that environment. So I take my uh, traveling circus to San Quentin and uh, Anybody who had the, the death row couldn't come, but, but if you were in any of the other blocks and you didn't have a security problem, you could come to the seminar. So I'm sitting in Red Nelson's office, the warden at the time one day, and, and I made my proposal. It was $20,000 a year, which isn't much now uh, and really wasn't much then, but about $200,000 a year in today's money. And he loved the idea. He said it'd be a great thing to do. And, and he loved it and he would push it through. And I said, okay, what, what are we looking at? And he said, Ben, I'm gonna be on this. A uh, couple of years, we'll get this done. I said, a couple of years. One of the reasons uh, I don't, I'm not a farmer, Eric, is I throw seed in the ground and I go, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. I don't have <laughs> five years for the grapevine to grow. I have a friend in the... <laughs> Christmas tree business from the time they plant a seedling to you can cut it is five years. I, I wouldn't make it. So I said, well, Red, what if I did it for free? He said, we could start this afternoon. <laughs> Picked up his microphone and made an announcement to the whole prison. If you're, if you have freedom, if you're supervisor, we'll let you blah, blah, blah. We're starting a new program. Uh, ben, what do we call it? I said, uh, people builders. He said, uh, it's called people builders. And you're welcome to join. So uh, an hour, less than an hour after I said free, I'm standing in a room with two or 300 inmates of various degrees of, uh, of violence and criminality. And we're starting that whole industry also, the, the prison reform industry. About six months into it, as best I recall, I didn't take notes because a lot of these things that I've been involved in, you don't know you're going to be talking about them 50 years later or 40 years later or what have you. But about six months in, our the guy who was in charge of making sure nobody got in my way inside the prison, I had free run. I could go anywhere except death row, and I could go there if I wanted to and had an escort. So... Uh, uh, our guy, Lieutenant Terry Wooster, came up to me and said, Ben, I've got an inmate who is fascinated, uh, sees you coming and going, and, and he wants to meet you. And I said, well, great. Tell him to come on down. He said, well, this one can't come down. Uh, he's in the adjustment center. The adjustment center is one step beneath death row. It's where you go if you're not sentenced to death or your sentence was overturned, but you still don't play well with others. He said, you'll have to go to him. I said, okay. Uh, who is it? And he said, well, he's looking at us right now from his cell uh, across the uh, breezeway and the, and the guard walk and all uh, is a little window and it lines up with right where we're standing at the front door of the Jewish chapel at San Quentin. He said he sees you come in every Saturday night and be greeted by a few hundred people and leave every Saturday morning with a few hundred people waving goodbye to him. He's just fascinated. He's a leader uh, too. He was a leader too. 
And I said, okay, what is his name? He said, Charlie Manson. Wow. I said, you're kidding me. <laughs> he said, no, because <laughs> I'd read all the stuff and I'd seen him interview with Geraldo Rivera, you know, he's going booga, 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 and acting totally crazy. He is crazy, but he's not what you see on television crazy. And uh, so I went up, you know, we set a, a time. I went up after a count and before the next count in that three hour window, because if a count doesn't clear, you don't, if you're a visitor, you stay where you are. I've had people come into People Builders as a guest and spend 12 hours locked in the cell with one of my uh, students because the count didn't clear. So I set up a three hour meeting and when the three hours started and ended, I walk into his cell, he looked like Charlie Manson, walk into his cell and I look around. He's in a two bunk cell, but nobody wanted to sleep with Charlie Manson. So one, the top bunk steel shelf was where he kept what few things he had. On the things list, he had one book. That was his library. How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. That was the first thing we talked about. I said, Charlie, what an interesting uh, book for you to have. And he said, it's my Bible. I couldn't have built the Manson family without it. Wow. If, you, if you've never read uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People, read it. It's one of the great books in our business, sales, working with other people, motivating other people, making other people feel important. One of the great books of all time. Read it. Uh, but it also proves that you can take information and do good or bad with it. Charlie Manson decided to build the Manson family and go kill people and start a race war and overcome it, take over the world. Uh, other people have used it to become the number one car dealer uh, in their area. So you pick it any way you want. Now down to the core question. When I was talking to Charlie, he had a little folding chair and I generally sat on the chair and he sat on his bunk. So we were knee to knee. Uh, I could almost reach both walls with my hands spread out. Uh, the uh, the and in it were those two bunks, a toilet sink combination, and a tiny little writing desk. That was it. Uh, so we're sitting there knee to knee, and I'm telling you, Charlie Manson's eyes were unbelievably powerful. I felt like he was looking through my eyes and out the back of my head uh, and uh, never broke eye contact. Uh, when he was talking to you, he was talking to you. And I remember thinking I, I was with him three different times. Uh, I remember thinking during one of those visits, boy, I am glad I didn't meet. I, I moved to California in the summer of love, 1967, but I was 25 and coming to run a big company. So uh, I, I didn't have a chance to encounter Charlie and his gang. But uh, the summer of love in Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco is sort of where he got started his recruiting process. Probably been doing it his whole life, but started his recruiting process. Uh, and... Uh, uh, I remember thinking to myself, boy, I'm glad I'm meeting him now, not when I was 17, 18, 19 years old, not formed yet, and have Charlie have some uh, part in my formation. It's like the young men who go to prison. It's a shame. You go to prison, you're middle aged. You are, for good or bad, you are what you are. But if you go there as a young man, prison becomes your parent. It shapes you, it shapes your thinking, it shapes your contacts that you'll have years later and everything. So I thank God every day I did not meet Charlie Manson in Haight Ashbury when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. It's entirely possible. And I don't say this for drama. I knew the man. I was up close and personal with him. Uh, unbroken eye contact for nine hours on broken up into three sessions. Uh, if I had met Charlie then, uh, Jimmy Rucker, my running buddy and business partner, it, we were of the same mindset. We might've wound up in Sharon Tate's house stabbing people. Uh, he was that persuasive and intense. Uh, but he also had a good, uh, oddly enough, a good sense of humor. He was nutty like you'd see on television in the Geraldo interview where, you know, Geraldo stared death in the eye. He interviewed Charlie Manson. It was in a room with seven or eight guards 
<laughs> and Charlie Manson is a little bitty guy about the size of Sammy Davis Jr. If you're old enough to know that he's tiny. So he wasn't a physical threat and Geraldo didn't stare death in the eye. I was in the cell locked in with him by myself for nine hours, never felt fear. I felt fascination, but never felt fear. Anyway, we're sitting there talking and I hear Keir keys out on the, uh, some reason I can't think of the word this morning, but where the guards come by the, the path in front of your cell, he was on the fifth tier in cell fifth tier. And I hear keys jingling. Well, what that means is the guard wants you to know that they're coming. They don't want to have a confrontation and a blow up every few minutes. So if they want to be known, they either let their keys jingle or jingle them. And uh, if they don't, they hold them tight and they're on you before you knew they were anywhere near you. So I hear the keys jingling and I, I said, excuse me, Charlie, turned around to see who was coming by, if I knew them or if they were coming for me. And Charlie said, excuse me just a second, sort of pushes me aside, runs up to the bars and goes, booga, 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 and all that crazy stuff you've seen. And the guard never broke uh, his stride and never looked at Charlie. He just kept going. He said, hi, Charlie, how are you? And walked on. And Charlie came back, sat down. He said, I'm sorry. They just love that. So that was the <laughs> I'm crazy Charlie Manson, like people think he was. What he was, he was crazy but it was a much more deep, evil crazy than Booga Booga. I wanna put a, a bow on the, this idea. And then since I have you here <clears throat> and you are one of the top sales trainers in the history of the world and we have- Thank you. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, you are amongst the greatest that have ever lived, Ben, in teaching sales. And I wanna ask you a couple of sales questions. Before we do that, I just want to put a bow on what Ben was saying, because when I was in the room with Ben and Arby asked him that question and Ben answered it, it impacted me so deeply that I'm bringing it up now 10 years later. And I reflect on that, that one conversation, Ben, that day when she asked you about Charlie Manson, because the, the main thing that Ben emphasized that day and he, he hit it today. <clears throat> He hit it today, but I want to make sure you guys all get this, is that when Ben was talking about when you were with Charlie, you, you know, you felt him. He was present. And so in selling, you can be in a sales presentation and not really be there, especially over Zoom. And or if you're over the phone, <clears throat> you can be surfing Facebook and you're actually giving your sales presentation over the phone. <clears throat> and I've reflected on this in my relationship with my wife where there's times when we're communicating and I'm not really there. And I'm reminding myself, Eric, put your smartphone down and be present with your, with your wife right now. So if I at times struggle with being present, there's probably one of you watching this right now that struggles with it as well. And if you recognize right now that there's value in you being more present, either in your sales conversations or in your, your relationship with your loved ones, just type the word yes in the chat right now. If that's resonating with you. And what I want to do. <laughs> Frank Thomas was just pointing yeah. out uh, that either he or whoever's with him has this problem. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it was such a powerful lesson. And, and now I want to take it in a little bit different direction, Ben. And I want to pull this photo up of you and I. This is back in the day. This is probably in um, <clears throat> the uh, the late 90s. And this was taken at a restaurant, I believe in Placerville. And this is Ben and I. And this is before I started my company. So I was a sales rep. And I reached out to Ben and I asked him if we could go to lunch. So I didn't have a training company. I didn't have any you know, books that I'd written and all the things I have now, I was just a sales rep reaching out to Ben and I'm like, hey, can we go to lunch? And he was kind enough to agree to go to lunch with me. And we've had a special friendship uh, and, a, and a, Ben's been one of my mentors. I've reached out to him throughout the years, going through struggles, asking him for his advice. He's always taken my phone call. He's anytime I've asked him to do a call like this, if he had the time to do it, 
he would do it. And um, he's just one of those special human beings that his life is about service and serving other human beings. And I'm grateful, Ben, for, you know, especially back when I was, you know, a sales rep and you had already achieved massive success with your books and your training and you were willing to spend some time and, and invest in mentorship with me. And you are the man behind the Closers book series, which is one of the all-time, you know, classic sales, sales books. And you've spent, um, you know, decades helping people just like the people that are on the Zoom right now. And I, I wanted to ask you, you know, for anybody watching right now that's not getting the sales results that they want, you know, what advice would you have for them? If they're like, Ben, I'm here and I want to make more sales, what should I do? I know that's a very generic statement, but what are some, some tips that you would have for somebody who wants to make more sales? Well, uh, I have found, I made up the figure, but I made it up based on you know, I've been in the business a long time, uh, 50, since 1960, uh, big money. I've been in the business since 1965. So it's what, 35, 45, 55, 56 years of making significant money. And uh, that's when I joined Holiday Magic Cosmetics and went from not making a whole lot, being number one, but number one in a small pond doesn't amount to much. But uh, number one at Holiday Magic changed life for me. It went from $100 a week to $40,000 a month in 1965 dollars. And uh, that whole time I've studied, I had the benefit of growing up two blocks out the front gate of East Lake Country Club, Bobby Jones Home Course in Atlanta, where we belonged and my family belonged. And I was allowed to go in the men's grill with my father so long as I didn't utter a word. I just sat there unless asked a direct question, in which case I was to answer yes or no, if at all possible, and no more than that. But I was sitting at the table with the people who founded Home Depot, uh, whoever the chairman of the board of Coca-Cola was at the time that came along with the membership. I mean, some heavy hitters. Most of the top 500 corporations in America had at least branch offices in Atlanta. And if they were high enough rank within their company, they were a member of East Lake. So that was the environment I grew up in. And I was trained to listen and learn. So when I got around people making a lot of money in a hurry, I listened and learned both the good news and the bad news. And distilled down, I have found out that 85%, that's a made up figure, but I could, if I had to, I could prove in court that it's 84, 85, 86% of all the problems in selling go away if you're selling a quality product or service, if that's you, then you've got to be a quality product or service that's competitively priced, doesn't have to be the cheapest, but it has to be competitively priced. Uh, and you spend your days talking to qualified people, qualified to buy it. It might be geography, religion, finance, whatever. There's a million different ways to be qualified but spend your time talking to people who are qualified to buy it. I have a brother who, because of the snow and lack of power, is over in the house sleeping as we speak, uh, who's a great trout fisherman. And I asked him one time, I said, what's the secret? Because he'd always come back with his full limit and his friends rarely did, or other people I talked to. And he said, well, Ben, the first thing you do is you have to go to the streams that are filled with trout. And I said, oh, that makes sense. He said, yeah, that's sort of the, the, that begins the secret of trout fishing. Well, it's the secret of success in selling also. Go to where the trout are uh, and uh, with a quality product or service that's competitively priced. And then I'll spill over into the other 15%. Be prepared to eloquently describe what the product or service is and what the benefit is to them. All they want to know with all the grandeur, you know, we want to serve people and they want to serve us and so on. What a customer is asking themselves consciously or subconsciously all the time is what's in it for me? That, you know, people, well, deal with your small businesses in your town because they deserve it. Well, they may or may not deserve it. We do whenever we can, but I do what's best for Ben Gay and Gigi Gay. Uh, and that may be, 
uh, from time, Gigi's placing an Amazon order this morning uh, that I would rather get in town, but in town it costs three times as much as I can get it from Amazon. So why would I do that? So understand what they want to know, what's in it for me, like we're talking about with Manson, have that in your head at all times. This person wants to know what's in it for me, make sure I can tell it to them. And that brings me to one of your favorite subjects, Eric, and that's scripting. Uh, people, oh, I don't want to learn a script. Scripts are terrible. I can always tell when somebody's on a script. Well, they must not watch much television or go to many movies since they spend, most people spend a lot of time watching people who are on scripts. Oftentimes, it's not even a script they learn. They've learned the ability to read off of a teleprompter that's right in front of them and to make it sound natural. So script, and I've, I've broken it down to this way, script chunks. You don't have to go, hi, my name is Ben Gay, blah, 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 for 40 minutes, can I have your money? Uh, there's script chunks. You asked me, for instance, something about Charlie Manson. Uh, you've heard that story before. What I just told you is word for word, or at least thought for thought, what I told you the last time you asked about Charlie Manson. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been at this a while, and as, as I tell my young sales friends, young in experience and or age, if you've been in selling over 30 days, you're on a script because you tend to say the same thing in the same situations. So that's not the issue. I'm not going to argue scripting with you. The question is, do you have a good quality tested script that produces results for the way you describe certain things. And here's what a script chunk is. Uh, we have a, a thing of a package of books and CDs and DVDs and audibles and so on. You can buy it uh, individually or you can buy the whole thing. This isn't a sales pitch, by the way. I'm just telling you, uh, if you ask me to describe the Closers Part Two, which is a better book than the Closers Part One, but it's not the the red blood meat. You know, the, the Part One is out of in any situation, come out the winner, and selling is a battle, and and so on. There's a lot of truth in that, but this is what sophisticated people really do with the information in Part One and the other books in the series. <laughs> if you ask me about closers part two, if I was describing the package, I'd say part one does this. It's the, the kicks, the blocks, and the punches of selling, uh, the red raw meat, the way selling really is not the way we wish it was. Then I would say the closers part two picks up where part one leaves off and shows you what sophisticated people really do with that information. Now, what I just said, Eric, is word for word what I have said thousands of times word for word what has sold 10 and a half million copies of the closers part one when we quit counting 25 years ago just saw a couple of heads pop up 10 and a half million copies without the internet without amazon without anything because i trained our me and our people to describe it in the most effective way possible word for word all the time we build holiday magic cosmetics up to taking in a million dollars a day uh, just in new sales by at 7.59, five nights a week, 7.59 p.m. local time in whatever language, and we were in 24, 25 countries, in whatever language and whatever product, because we had the exact same scripts and marketing plan for several other companies that didn't sell cosmetics, a vitamin line, a motor oil line, and so on. You, when you walk to the front of the room, you were trained to give, com combined with a 15-minute film that had been produced and presented to you, uh, you were trained to deliver, in essence, a 43-minute, 47-minute, something like that, word-for-word -word script, no matter the product, no matter the language, no matter the country, because we polished it and honed it and so on. When I joined Holiday Magic, some guy wandered to the front of the room. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. I'm making a lot of money. You want to? Okay. And that was about it. And that, it, because I want to make a lot of money, I still got hooked. But I told my father that night uh, when the, the meeting was over and I'd left, I said, I just want the most amateurish thing I've ever 
seen. Uh, but the product's good and the marketing plan's fantastic. So I think I'm going to join. And he said, well, and start pushing them to develop scripts and uh, present formulated presentations. He needed them, by the way, in his business. My father was a dynamic swashbuckling guy, sort of like the combination between Errol Flynn and Jimmy Cagney, was scared to death to speak in public. And so he memorized whatever he had to say. He scripted it. And when he got up as president of this and head of that and so on, I would watch him and I knew how fearful he was, but I saw what scripting did to get him through the situations. So quality product, competitively priced, spend your days talking to qualified prospects, learn how to be, become a person of class, quality, and substance with the ability to tastefully project that you are a person of class, quality, and substance. Understand what they wanna know is what's in it for me. They don't care what's in it for you. They don't care if your children are successful, grow up, starve to death, or go to Harvard. They just, I don't care how sweet and nice they are, what's in it for me, and effectively just, uh, develop a way to tell them what's in it for them. Uh, and then, I wanna piggyback what, what Ben just said, so all of you can really get the power of one of the points. He made several points there, but one of one of the important points is to ask yourself this question in 2021, which of course is going to be over here in a couple of days. Did you get in front of enough prospects to deliver your presentation to? And it's a yes or a no. And if next year, 2022, if you're like, you know what, Eric. You know what, Ben, I need to get myself in front of more prospects and deliver more quality sales presentations. Just type in the chat, I do. If you need to get in front of more prospects next year versus what you did this year to deliver your presentation, just type in the words I do. Because one of the issues with social media is you can go get in front of your, your phone or your computer and scroll all day long and not be doing sales activities. You can be messing around with LinkedIn and looking up this and looking up that. And, you know, we, we love that you're here because you're, you know, we want you to be here and learning from us, but you can be doing training videos all day long. But at, at the end of the day, you, you've got to get in front of prospects. You've got to get in front. And that might be something for you for 2022 to go, you know what? That's going to be when Ben was talking about what he learned from Napoleon Hill. And one of the things was focus. And maybe it's focus on delivering more sales presentations to qualified prospects. And Ben, I want to come back to scripting for a moment. And I don't remember if I told you this, maybe I have told you a story before or not, but it has to do with how you and I met in the first place. And I was speaking in a prepaid legal meeting back in the day when I used to be a sales rep um, for Tony Robbins. And I was promoting his seminars and prepaid legals now changed their name to Legal Shield. And so after the meeting, I was sitting around talking to some of the people that were there and we got to talking about sales books. And one of them said, oh, you got to get the closers. And at that point in time, I hadn't heard of it. And I said, I, I'm not familiar with that book. And they're like, oh, you're not familiar with that book. That's the best book ever written on the subject of selling, which is a script, by the way. When that person said to me, it's the best book ever written on the subject of selling, that my ears went, what? Like I had to pay attention because it was so powerful in their conviction of what they said. And I don't know how this happened, but they had your number, Ben, for some reason. And they said, look, you call Hampton Books and here's the number. And they gave me the phone number and I put it in my coat pocket. Front page of every yeah. book. <laughs> they, they had, had somehow number. they had Ben's phone number on them. The company phone. They didn't say it's Ben's phone number. They said it's the book publisher's phone number. And so I put it in my coat pocket. And you guys might've had this experience before where you put something in your coat pocket and you forget about it. And a couple months pass and I'm reaching to my coat pocket for whatever reason, I, and I pull out this phone number. And it's like, huh, that's the phone number of that book. That's the best book I've written on subject of selling. I'll call. So I call the number and this person answers the phone. And I said, yeah, I heard about your book and I'd like to get the book. And so then the person that answered the phone starts saying, okay, well, let me tell you about the book. And they went into the script that, you know, I wrote the, you know, this book, and then we have part two, and then we got the newsletter. And then, and then the next thing you know, it was Ben who answered the phone. And he says, and the, something like the reason I wrote the newsletter is, and I'm like, wait a minute, is this actually the author? 
And I, I stopped him. I said, is this Ben? And he goes, yeah, this is Ben. And he, he continued on with the script. And at the end, I'm calling to buy a $10, $20 book. And at the end of that phone call, I kid you not, out comes my credit card for $199 plus shipping and tax to buy this package. And then that started our relationship that's lasted now, you know, more than 20 years. Because when that phone call came in, Ben already had the script down. So you, you got to put the prep in in advance because you don't know when the call's coming in. Because if you're not ready, when the, Ben didn't know I was going to call that day. So I called that day and he was prepared, not just prepared for me, prepared for every time he answered the phone or he had one of his team answer the phone. And so, you know, what he's talking about with, with the scripting and delivering a quality presentation to a, a prospect that's qualified and having a product that's fairly priced. And, and then you just you focus on that, not on Twitter and on LinkedIn and on Facebook and all this other stuff, although that there's a time and a place for that. But we got to sell, guys. Got to roll up the sleeves and put forth put forth the work and sell. So Ben, we've got a couple minutes left, and I'm you know if you want to promote your books, I'm happy. I endorse your books. I think your your books are amazing. If you want to talk about your books, so yeah, probably there's some people right now that would love to buy from you. So you want to share with people how they can buy from you? Well, the closers part one is the best selling, most popular. Uh, most powerful book on selling ever written. And I say that without ego involved because I didn't write the first draft of what's now called The Closers Part One. I bought it uh, to try and get them to put an 800 number in their advertising. It's the only reason I bought it when we were running the, the National Communication Center. Uh, I read it, felt like I'd found the, deep, dead, uh, the dead sea scrolls of selling. It was poorly written, poorly printed, poor, poorly bound. Uh, and I almost just threw it in the trash when I opened the envelope. Uh, but then I read it and uh, I called the guy from LaGuardia to pay phone. You all, most of you, except for the ladies, look old enough to know what a pay phone is. They used to be on the wall. You put coins in them and dial people. I went to the pay phone in LaGuardia and I said, hi, I just finished, dialed the number in the book. I said, I just finished reading the closers. And this guy said, Mr. Gay, how are you? And I'm looking around, I'm thinking I'm on candid camera. There was no caller ID then. I wasn't on my phone anyway. I didn't have a phone. And uh, I said, how did you know my name? He said, oh, we uh, printed 500 copies of the closers. And uh, there's a story in that that I won't bore you with now. We printed 500 copies of the closers. We ran one ad one day in the Wall Street Journal and we sold one book. So if, you, if you've read The Closers, your name is Ben Gay and you live in Placerville, California. <laughs> That's amazing. Negotiated for a few minutes and I said, all right, how many do you have? I may buy these and give them away in spite of their horrible condition because there's a good message. He said, I don't have to go count. Like I told you, we printed 500, we sold one. I have 499, would you like them? <laughs> and I said, sure. So I took the 499 gave them a lot of them away in the beginning. Then they started selling them to their people. These were my marketing reps. And then people said, how can we get more? So I called back, negotiated the rights to rewrite it, uh, own it, uh, and distribute it. And we did and turned it into the best-selling book of all time in the field of selling. Unless you think, Think and Grow Rich is a sales book, which Dr. Napoleon Hill did. He said it's a sales manual sort of interesting, but so is uh, how to win friends and influence people. So it's available and I'll give you the, the uh, where you get it for less than I will sell it to you for if you're interested. Go to stores, S-T-O-R-E-S dot eBay dot com slash forward slash, I'm, I'm told I should say, forward slash Ronzoni Books, R-O-N-Z O N E books, B O O K S. And George, since you're writing that down, I know you're going to order. I will sign and date them, <laughs> all of them. If I can break the habit of signing Christmas, I've sold, uh, signed several thousand books this month, and they all wanted them dated 1225. Um, so give the link it, again, and then if somebody can type it into the chat. So give the link one more time, Ben. Okay, stores like a store you go to, stores.ebay.com 
Ronzoni, not spelled like the spaghetti, R-O-N-Z-O-N-E, books, all one word, Ronzoni books. And there up will come the offerings. Now, here's the real trick. And if you order, wonderful, but I didn't come on to sell books. If you, if you order, read the material. Start with, in Closers Part 2, start with page 257. It's called Sales Infiltration. It's what I really do. I know 500 closes. I use one or two. Uh, and it, uh, I know many different ways to present and ask for the money and so on. I only use sales infiltration. I had to know all the other stuff to get down to what really matters. And sales infiltration really describes it. Then read it, absorb it, mark it up. It's the reason I push the books. You can't. You need to underline it, highlight it, dog ear it. My original copy of the closers, uh, somebody once offered, said, "Can I buy that one?" I said, "Sure, ten thousand dollars." And they said, "Why? It's a paperback." I said, "Yeah, it's a paperback with forty years of my notes in it and my underlines and so on. So it's worth a whole lot more than it was when it came out of the printing, the print shop." So uh, they didn't buy it. Sort of a shame. Uh, Dr. Hill used to complain the first time I was at our house, my wife at the time, she's now passed away, Marcia, had laid out a copy of Think and Grow Rich. We walk into this magnificent living room overlooking San Francisco Bay and the dominant feature in the room was Think and Grow Rich on the coffee table aimed where you, would be, you could read it walking into the room. It was sort of tacky, I thought. I was actually embarrassed. It looked like, you know, we sit around and read your book as a family every night, Dr. Hill. And uh, so embarrassed, I said, oh, look, Dr. Hill, <laughs> a copy of your book. I said, how does it feel to have written, uh, back then they used to say second only to the Bible, one of the best-selling books in the history of mankind. I think there's about 110 or 112 million now, <clears throat> like me, they don't know how many they've sold, but over 100 million probably. And uh, how does it feel to have written that? He said, yes, best-selling, least read. And then I learned the lesson of Dr. Hill. Let me give it to you. This book, Think and Grow Rich, is 75 years old. He addressed it to Mrs. Grace Dixon. She obviously went to a seminar. I've been in this business long enough to tell you exactly what happened to this book. Grace Dixon somehow found, Mrs. Grace Dixon somehow found out that Dr. Hill was coming to town to do something. She bought a ticket, drove downtown, uh, wherever it was, uh, went to the meeting. At the, during the meeting, at the end of the meeting, Dr. Hill encouraged him to buy the books and come forward and I'll, there at the back, come forward and I'll sign them. She got in the buy line, then she got in the signing line. And then Dr. Hill opened the book to the front page and signed it. This book, this exact copy was picked. This is not the one I was given the day I joined Holiday Magic. This is a few years ago, just a few years ago. A friend of mine who worked for me and knew of my relationship with Dr. Hill bought it at a garage sale for 50 cents. And she said, when I opened it, Ben, I realized you had to have it. So she gave it to me. Now let's study the book. There's the front, 75 years old, cherry red. There's the back cherry red. Here's the spine bleached out by the sun. And when I went to open the book, when Sandra Noma gave it to me, the spine had never been cracked and I won't crack it now. It, it was open this far for Dr. Hill to sign it and this far every time I show it to somebody, but the spine has not been cracked. Mrs. Dixon did what so many people do with books that could change their lives. She went out of her way to get it. She paid for it. She got it signed if that was possible. She took it home with the best of intentions, stuck it in her bookcase, and there it sat for 75 years. Then she died. I'm telling you, I know this. I don't know Mrs. Grace Dixon, but I know the story. Then she died, and the daughter-in-law, it's always the daughter-in-law who cleans up, and that's the, the lady who sells the ottoman and the beanbag chair that the guy had when he was a happy bachelor. The daughter-in-law packaged up Mrs. Grace Dixon's belongings and decided this was worthless and threw it in a box for 50 cents. And there it sat. 
So, and I go in people's offices now, oh, Mr. Gay, I have the closers, look right here. And I open it to see, and half the time the spine has never been cracked. All signed, because if they leave here, I sign them and date them. Uh, but the spine's never been cracked. The closers will change your sale, the series will change your sales life if you read it, focus, read it, and if you take action with what you've learned. If you're, if you're not going to do all that, save your money. Don't bother. And that's true of uh, how to win friends and influence people. It's true of Think and Grow Rich and every other great book. Earl Nightingale was one of my buddies and mentors said, if you want to keep a secret, print it in a book and put a copy in every library in the world. He said, your secret will be safe. Well, Ben, I um, am grateful for you. And um, I, I know you've helped a lot of people, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, you know, with your books, millions, tens of millions. You, but you've helped me. You made a difference in my life. And, and vice versa. Thank you. And what's really special is that before I became, you know, colleague in the same industry and started a training company, and you took my call and invested in time with me and you've always taken my call and there's times that I've been in pretty tough spots and you've given me some really valuable <laughs> advice, you know, with my back against the wall and you've always, whenever I've asked you if you were available, you always said yes. And so um, aside from helping millions of people, thank you for helping me and for making a difference in my life. Um, it really is meaningful to me. And um, since you are the last known living protege of, of Napoleon Hills, I just thought it would be wonderful to have you here today um, as we've been training on his work all month long. And uh, so thank you for, for being here, for everybody that's listening and um, for showing up powerfully in my life. Thank you, Eric. It was my honor and pleasure. And thank all of you for continuing to keep Dr. Hills work uh, moving through the generations it's terribly important <laughs> y'all have a great day let's go out and make some sales We've got a couple days left in the year thanks for joining us we'll talk to you later bye, -bye.